bless you. Thank you for coming this evening. There are uh, many ways to start an evening such as this. I uh, think I'm going to tell you a joke. You'll appreciate it, you unity people. It seems that um, Jesus was having a busy day interviewing people to get into heaven. Something you want to think about. <laughs> a long line of people close to the end of the day. Jesus looked up and there was this old man with a white beard. He looked into his eyes and he said, Sir, there's something about you. He said, Tell me. He said, uh, While you were on earth, what did you do? The old man looked down at him, squinting, and said, Well, son, he said, uh, I was a carpenter. Jesus said, A carpenter? Boy, that's familiar. He said, um, Tell me. He said, um, Where did you live? The old man looked at him and he said, Well, he said, I lived in a land far, far away. Boy, chills started to go through Jesus. He looked up once more and he said, Tell me, he said, You didn't happen to have uh, a son while you were on earth, did you? The old man looked at him and he said, Well, some say I did, and some say I didn't. Jesus couldn't take it anymore. He put his pencil down, stood up, threw his arms out and said, Father! The old man looked at him through his spectacles and said, Pinocchio? <laughs> I like that story. <laughs> The, uh, she just got it. It's a <laughs> carpenter, land, never, no, Geppetto, I'll explain it. So. I guess uh, what I would first like to say is that um, uh, all of the things that I'll be speaking about here this evening come from my heart. They don't come from any particular canned speech that I have that I just uh, toss out as I go across the country and around the world. And that all of the things that I speak about here are things that I am working on in my own life. I also do not want to be perceived as um, anybody's guru. Um, I don't think of myself that way. I, I uh, have really worked hard at taming my own ego. Uh, I don't want to take the credit for any of the things that you have been able to do in your life. Largely because I don't want the blame if you've been screwing it up. <laughs> And if you're going to take credit, you've got to be willing to take the blame. I um, have had the same kinds of heartaches and struggles that all of you have gone through. I've been through divorce. I've been through separation. I've had, uh, I've had bouts with, uh, with uh, addictions in my life. I've left them behind. I've struggled with it. Um, I am today what I call a camel. I don't know if you know what a camel is. It's an animal that... Uh, begins its days on its knees, and it ends its day on its knees, and it can go 24 hours without a drink. <laughs> and um, and I have eight children. Um, five of them are under 12. Um, I have teenagers and a 27-year-old. Some of you can't see in the back, this may look like a bald head to you, but it's, it's really a solar panel for a sex machine. I just... Uh... <laughs> I live in the sun in Florida, so it's a working overtime. And, uh... and um, go through all of the same kinds of uh, things that you go through in uh, your lives in raising children and trying to do as good a job as you can and take care of all of the uh, things that come along in your life. So um, I am a messenger and I have been given a gift of being able to write. 
and to speak, and um, I go where I'm sent. What I'm going to speak about tonight is um, largely what I have written about in a brand new book that will be released soon called Your Sacred Self. And it is really about um, the triumph of the higher part of ourselves over the ego. It is really my effort this evening to help you to leave here with a, um, a blueprint, if you will, for um, transcending your lower identities and allowing this uh, sacred part of yourself. In a uh, book that I uh, researched and read and met the author, uh, called uh, The Tibetan Book of the Living and the Dying, written by Sogyal Rinpoche um, from Tibet. He has a quotation in there that I, that I found very useful in putting together uh, this new book. Uh, he said that uh, two people have been living inside of you all of your life. One is the ego, which is demanding, easily offended, believes in its separateness, thinks that it's special, garrulous, and insane. The other is your hidden higher self whose beautiful voice is rarely heard or attended to. And I am going to be talking about um, something that I call heightened awareness. And heightened awareness is, um, for me, the, the uh, sort of organization of this evening's presentation uh, flows around a, uh, uh, a theme of, uh, first of all, sort of trying to explain t what I mean by higher awareness. And then um, I have five keys to higher awareness, what they are. And as I talk about each one of them, and whatever stories I tell or however it gets presented, uh, I will point them out for those of you who are, are more linear than I am and want to take notes, or those of you who are listening to this on tape. Um, you'll see this blueprint, and I believe very strongly, I don't believe it, I know very, very firmly that if you can master these five keys to higher awareness, you can literally become... Uh, your own miracle worker and begin to manifest uh, whatever it is that you need for this journey that you're on here. In uh, the New Testament, which I read very carefully from the beginning to the end, um, before writing Your Sacred Self, I also took on the Kabbalah, which I didn't uh, realize was as long as it was, but I committed myself to reading it and uh, trying to understand a, a tiny percentage of it. <laughs> an ancient uh, text that's been passed on by mystical scholars for uh, thousands of years. I also read the Bhagavad Gita again and um, completed A Course in Miracles. And in reading those four sort of spiritual uh, guides, um, then I prepared myself for writing. And in the New Testament, there is a uh, quotation attributed to Jesus um, from St. John. It said that... Um, even the least among you can do all that I have done and even greater things. And I have taken that literally. I, I truly believe that each and every one of us have within us the capacity to be miracle workers and to live a life that is way beyond anything that uh, most of us have ever contemplated before. We haven't allowed ourselves to contemplate some of these things. And so some of the material that I'll be presenting here or talking about here this evening will be um, processed by some of you as weird and strange, and um, that's fine. I'll even point those out as I go along so that you won't think I don't know what you're thinking. <laughs> but they are still things that I know are possible. And um, as I talk about... Um, some things that perhaps you wouldn't expect someone with my background and training uh, to be talking about. Uh, I'd like you to uh, listen to this, um, right at the very beginning, this beautiful uh, story that um, Buddha 
used to uh, tell his uh, people. Before I even do that, though, I'd, I'd, I'd be, so that I just don't forget something I talked about on the radio and on TV this morning uh, here at KTAR um, when I was being preempted by the OJ trial um, <laughs> in and out, is that I'd like to say we've got a couple of thousand people here this evening, and I would really like to say to you, as I will be saying uh, all across the country and all around the world as I'm going on tour, doing a, a national sort of speaking tour on promoting higher consciousness in our country and in Europe and in uh, Australia, with uh, people such as Deepak Chopra and Marianne Williamson and Louise Hay and Stuart Wilde. And uh, we are touring, talking about these things. And one of the things, I received a letter from a man whom I hold very dear in my heart. His name is Eknath Eswaran. And uh, Eknath uh, Eswaran is really his first name, but in the part of India where he's from, they go for a last name first. So Eswaran um, wrote to me and asked me if in my talking, I would tell people that this, and he wrote me this letter in uh, September, he had pointed out that over 15,000 articles in national publications had already been written about this trial before they even had selected a jury, and that the energy that we are putting into all of the minutia of this particular crime is something that is going to bring us down. And so I would ask you to go out from here and to pay less titillating attention to the details of this particular uh, current uh, thing that is dividing us racially. Thank you. It's dividing us as a people. It is putting an emphasis on violence. It is uh, energy. We are uh, collectively placing in it way, way too much energy on the, the kinds of things that uh, uh, will really bring us uh, apart rather than together. And I don't watch it and I don't read about it and I don't comment on it. And um, I really would like the kinds of people who have showed up here this evening um, to just turn your attention uh, and when it does come on, just put love out there and just kind of surround all of the souls that are involved in this, uh, in this drama uh, with light and with love and, uh, and let the process take care of itself and stay out of it. Stay out of it. It's very, very important. And Eswaran is, is one of the leading, leading spiritual figures. I think he's a living saint. He's 83 years old. Um, he wrote Dialogue with Death, which I'll talk about later this, uh, this evening. And uh, as the interpreter for most of the, those of you who have ever read the Bhagavad Gita in English, probably read his uh, interpretation of it. So that's my little spiel on OJ. Um, here's the story. Uh, it's from uh, Legacy of the Heart. This is a story told by Buddha to his students. So I'm saying it to you at the beginning here tonight. A young widower who uh, loved his five-year-old son very much was away on business. And bandits came and burned down the entire village and took his son away. When the man returned, he saw the ruins and he panicked. He took the charred corpse of an infant to be his own child, and he began to pull his hair and beat his chest, crying uncontrollably. He organized a cremation ceremony and collected the ashes and put them in a very beautiful velvet pouch. Working, sleeping, or eating, he always carried the bag of ashes with him. One day his real son escaped from the robbers and found his way home. He arrived at his father's new cottage at midnight and knocked at the door. And you can imagine at that time the young father who was still carrying the bag of ashes and crying, he asked, who is there? And the child answered, it's me, Papa. Open the door. It's your son. In his agitated state of mind, the father thought that some mischievous boy was making fun of him. And he shouted at the child to go away. And he continued to cry. The boy knocked again and again, but the father refused to let him in. Some time passed, and finally the child left. And from that time on, father and son never saw one another again. And after telling this story, the Buddha said, Sometime, somewhere, you take something to be the truth. If you cling to it so much, when the truth comes in person and knocks at your door, you will refuse to open it. 
It's a powerful story for beginning students uh, learning to be Brahmins. And it's a powerful story for each and every one of us. Is that we have to have what we learned when I was studying literature back at the university. We have to have this thing called w the willing suspension of disbelief. And this is what you do every time you go into a movie theater. You don't go up to the screen and look at the screen and say, you know, this is really ridiculous. I mean, this is two dimensions and that's really light being projected onto that screen. And I'm not going to let my emotions be affected by a two-dimensional light being projected up there. This is absurd. You don't do that. You willingly suspend your disbelief and allow yourself to be entertained. And then when the evening or when the movie is over, you pick up your doubt and you go out and, uh, uh, and make your own decisions about it. That's all I would ask. That's all I'm asking of some of the things that I'll be speaking about here this evening. It's just to willingly suspend your disbelief, like you do when you read a novel or see a, a movie. And then just allow it in. And try to allow it in with an absence of judgment. Just open yourself up to new possibilities. Particularly possibilities for you. Because that quotation that is attributed to Jesus about even the least among you can do all that I have done, think about what that truly means. That means that you have a capacity within you to literally um, manifest whatever it is that you want for yourself through a miraculous process called intention. And I'd like to begin by talking about what that means. You see, when you reach this heightened state of awareness, what happens is that you begin to develop a consciousness that allows you to manage the coincidences of your life. Something that Carl Jung spent his lifetime writing about and talking about. That instead of thinking of things happening to you and the coincidences that sort of just show up in your life that you call oh, miracles, or that you call, wow, isn't that, wasn't that weird, or wasn't that an interesting set of circumstances for that all to come together like that. You begin to have a different awareness, which is where I place my attention and leave my attention by, by leaving my ego behind and allowing this higher part of myself to reside there. Where I keep my attention, I can literally bring into the world of the manifest or I can go from the wave to the particle or whatever you want to call that. And that's a very intriguing notion. I, I wrote a book a few years ago called You'll See It When You Believe It. And um, I have a chapter in there that I called synchronicity. Now this is a, a Jungian term and it really sort of defines this process of um, of how you, can con how you can collaborate with fate. Now most of us have been trained on a set of beliefs that keep us from having uh, any conviction that this is something that is within our control. In fact, many of us have been trained to believe that to even think like this is blasphemous. To think that you have perhaps this kingdom of heaven is within you. And in reading the New Testament, and I always wonder about so, many, so much criticism when I talk, I remember talking on the Oprah show one time about uh, uh, God, uh, that most people don't have a problem believing in God, they have a, pro a problem in, uh, in knowing that they are God. That God is within them. And she said to me, she said, you realize that there's a lot of people watching all over this country, particularly in certain regions of the country, who are going to find this, uh, this idea that God, that they are God, um, pretty, pretty absurd. And I said, well, that's, probably, that's just the way it is. And then as I was getting prepared to write this, uh, this new book, I came across St. Paul's letters to the Philippians. And in Philippians 2, which is a series of letters that St. Paul wrote after being in prison, about words of Jesus, because St. Paul literally wrote the New Testament. And he said these words. And I often want to ask the people who find this so blasphemous what these words mean. He said in Philippians 2, 
verses 5 and 6. He said, have in you the same mind as Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. And so I would ask you to consider that and have that mind. That God is not just something that is outside of you, but that you are extensions of it. And it doesn't really matter what you call it. Alan, Alan Watts once said to me in 1971, he said, Wayne, don't forget this. He said, you cannot get wet from the word water. <laughs> you cannot get wet from the word water. So it isn't the word that makes water wet. It is whatever it is. Speaking of which, I need some of that. Oh, here it is right here. Just manifest it. I mean, if this stuff works so great, I'm telling you. I love you. <laughs> I love you too. This is water. And it doesn't matter what you call it. And the same thing is true for this divine force that flows through everything and everyone. It doesn't matter what you call it. So get off of it. <laughs> it isn't the label. As Kierkegaard said, once you label me, you negate me. It's not what you call me. I'm not what you call me. Nor is God. If you want to call it God, great. Call it, call it soul, great. Spirit, consciousness, awareness, Whatever you want to call it, Louise, Ralph, whatever pleases you. It is not what you call it. It is the universal Tao. So we'll just call it God. And if you're dyslexic, dog, okay? <laughs> and we'll just put a name, we'll just call it that for this evening. But that's not what it is. So if you have a better name, by all means, use that. But no that this thing, this divine force, is in all of us. And that in order to be able to get to this state of heightened awareness where you can manage the coincidences of your life and know this eternal force and be able to manifest and create whatever it is that is in your heart's desire as long as you stay on purpose, you must first do some things that perhaps um, are difficult for us to do. So the first key to higher awareness is um, this, I call it erasing uh, your past. Erasing your past. And this I will spend the most time on because it's the one that the most people struggle with. Now this thing about... about um, Managing your emotions and managing your coincidences, rather, is uh, something that I'm going to refer to as uh, intention. Intention. I've got to resist using this blackboard because I know there's people about a mile and a half away back there, and uh, I can hardly see it myself this close. Um, but being a teacher, uh, I don't really get going until I get the chalk in my hand. So just let me have the chalk, all right? And I'm feeling much more secure now. <laughs> An intention is something that I can only illustrate to you by, and, and so that you will understand this thing of synchronicity and being able to create, like, I'm in uh, Madison Square Garden last November, all right? and I'm going to give a talk there at the Felt Forum. And I used to teach at St. John's University in New York, in Queens. And it had been, oh, maybe 17, 18 years since I had been back. I left there in 1976, and um, I hadn't seen my uh, former department head uh, who hired me at St. John's right after I got my doctorate in 1970. Uh, to come there and teach, and, and a really nice guy and a very good friend. So I thought, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to look him up. I've been thinking about him a lot, and I'm going to look him up. So about two hours before I go on, I'm thinking about Bob, and I go to the lobby of the Felt Forum, and I go into a phone booth, 
And I get the Long Island, he lived in Garden City, I get the Long Island uh, directory, and I go to Garden City, and I'm looking up his name, looking up his name, and I can't quite find it, and I turn around and I look up, and he's standing there. Now, it's 18 years since I've seen this man, and I've been thinking about him, and I'm thinking I'm going to call, and he's standing there. Now, everybody goes, oh, booga, booga, wow, what's going on here? I've got to call everybody I know. I've got to, you say, okay. So there was a time when I used to do the same thing. Oh, man. But see, this stuff happens so much now that I'm beginning, maybe I've got to really work on this ego thing, but I'm beginning to think that I can do this. All right? <laughs> see? So now I don't even just think I can do it, I know I can do it. I know that the mechanics of creation are such that if I stay on purpose in my life, where I place my attention, I can manifest from that placement of attention as long as I do it without the other four keys to higher, with the other four keys to higher awareness, which I'm not going to tell you about yet. But as long as I keep my attention there, and don't allow anyone else to smear it. You see, in order to be able to create anything for yourself in your life, you first must be able to conceive of it. And the corollary of that is, if you can't conceive of it, you can't create it. And the problem in trying to teach people to become spiritual masters, enlightened beings, the problem is not in teaching the mechanics of this. The mechanics are really quite simple. What you do is really fairly simple to do. The problem is in convincing people that they have the capacity to do it. Because most of us are stuck in something, now I do have to write this, I'm sorry. <laughs> something called a paradigm, a paradigm. And a paradigm is a way of thinking or behaving which traps us into believing like the father with, the, with his son, into believing a truth because we've had it drilled into us by so many people that we can't think any other way. And that's why I say this first key is so important. You have to be able to let go of your past. And before we take a break, I am going to try to give you, I'm not going to try, I'm going to give you the, the formula for doing that and try to illustrate it with some of what I think of as the, uh, the best stuff that's ever come down the pike in terms of getting rid of this, uh, this stuff in the past. But a paradigm, let me give you an illustration of a paradigm. In 1968, okay, go back, 1968, what country in the world do you think was the world's largest manufacturer of wristwatches. Switzerland, you get an A. And everybody would have come up with that, virtually everybody, in 1968. The Swiss had been making watches for centuries, and they were considered the leading experts on watches. Now it's 1995, okay? Less than 30 years later. And what country, by a factor of 10 to 1, is the leading producer of wristwatches in the world today? Japan. Now, the reason why that shift has taken place in a relatively short period of time is something called paradigm. In 1968, someone came to the Swiss manufacturers in Geneva and said, we have a new idea for making watches. We're going to get rid of the mainspring. We're going to get rid of the winding mechanism. We're going to get rid of the whole inside. And we are going to replace it with a quartz movement and put in a battery. That battery is going to last for years, and it will keep perfect time, and it's going to transform the watchmaking industry. And the Swiss said, don't tell us how to make watches. We have been doing it for centuries. We are the experts. We will tell you. That was their paradigm. And they continued making watches the way they did, and they went to the Japanese. Now, that little example, I've always remembered that when I heard that the first time. And I say it to you because you can also get stuck in a paradigm 
in your life in lots and lots of areas. Most of us have these kinds of things that we hang on to and that we believe so strongly because we have been conditioned by all of our well-meaning sort of uh, uh, other egos who have shown up in our life to guide us and have directed us on a path that is mostly directed by our lower identities. And while we, uh, we pay some attention to our higher identities, we usually just do it on Sunday mornings or Saturday, Saturday evenings. And the rest of the time we have sort of a, a whole different way of approaching it. And a paradigm is something, now I have a teacher that I work with that is really, um, I think, a, a, a very enlightened being. And he um, told me, he said, if you want to get out of the paradigms that you're in, and I said, like, me? <laughs> I'm Wayne Dyer. <laughs> I'm not stuck in anything, all right? He said, well, one of the things you're going to have to learn to do is you're going to have to learn to kill your ego. I said, well, I really can do that. I can kill my ego. I said, well, what's the test? How do you know when you've killed your ego? He said, well, the test for killing your ego is you check yourself into a dirty, grungy motel room that smells of piss and you stay in that room until it no longer matters whether you're there or not and whether anyone visits you or not and the minimum stay is three months <laughs> You have to stay until it doesn't matter whether someone visits you or you visit someone else. You just check yourself in. And I said, when? He said, now. I said, well, I got to call. My no, you don't call. You do it. I said, well, I already failed the first test. So the second test of being able to get out of a paradigm is to get up between 3 and 6 a.m. every day for two years. And in that time period, you walk in the woods, and if there's no woods, you walk in the streets without any fear. You abandon fear, and you walk, or you run. In the woods, preferably, and after two years, you will know why you are doing it. And I am in that test right now. I've been in it since August the 18th. In reading the Seth material, Jane Roberts said that we are awake at the wrong time and asleep at the wrong time. That the best time to be awake is between 3 and 6 a.m., wherever you are. And that, she said, virtually every single one of you and I'd like to put you to this test. Every one of you will receive a wake-up call from God between 3 and 6 a.m. You will wake up for a moment, note the time, and then listen to your ego and go back to sleep. <laughs> or maybe get up if you've got a prostate problem <laughs> and get right back into bed and say, well, it's 3.30, I don't get up at 3.30 in the morning. Only a fool would do that, you see. And that the best time to be asleep is between 3 and 6 in the afternoon. And that between 3 and 6 in the morning is when the world is silent. And you will, and, and I've learned this after 6, 7 months of doing this, I've learned that um, I am the most clear in these hours. And I have begun to have this awareness after six months now of, uh, of being up in these hours that, um, that I am losing the paradigm that I was stuck in. And the paradigm that I was stuck in says, if you don't get enough sleep, you're going to be very tired for the rest of the day. 
And I've only had, let me see, to tell, let me see how fit I am and how good I feel. Where's my watch? Where's the clock? I've got to find out. Well, let's see. I went to bed at 11, 11, 10, four hours. It's going to be a deficit of four hours. So I'm not going to, I'm going to be sleepy all the rest of the day. And then I'm not going to get this done. And tonight we've got to go here and I'm going to be sleepy then. I'm going back to sleep. <laughs> I was an ancient Sufi poet. His name was Rumi. And Rumi had, in one of his poems, he said, Do not go back to sleep. Do not go back to sleep. Do not go back to sleep. So what I have done, and what my teacher said to me, he said, you will find this difficult at first, because your ego will be telling you all the reasons why this is absurd. So what you do is you wake up and you put your feet on the floor. And then if you want to go back to sleep, sleep with your feet on the floor. <laughs> which I have done on a few occasions. <laughs> but not for very long. And the ironic thing about all of this is that I now, when I go to sleep, it doesn't make any difference what time it is, I can't wait for three or four o'clock in the morning to arrive and to get out there and be and what, no matter what the temperature is or what city I'm in or where I am it, I can't wait for that and I have eradicated fear from my consciousness it's just like knowing that I'm, I'm protected and that I'm fine and that it's going to be alright and so I would just like throw that out to you there are probably people in the room here who get up in those hours not to go to work but often to meditate or to write or to do, uh, to do their music or to, uh, to create whatever it is that you're creating or to think through whatever. To me All of, this is a very, very spiritual time of the day. It is the most spiritual time of the day. It is the time when you have more silence. And as Melville said, silence is God's one and only voice. And you will begin to make a direct side of communication with the higher part of yourself if you can remove so many of the distractions so that's a paradigm another paradigm that I've learned to transcend was when I uh, went through a week of training with Taekwondo and in Taekwondo you learn how to use your feet as if they were hands now most of us have been taught that our hands do certain things and our feet do certain things our feet are for walking our hands are for picking things up but you can learn in a very, quite a short time, if you have banished all of that doubt and opened yourself up and uh, you know, had that willing suspension of disbelief, if you willingly suspend that, you can train your feet to do everything that your hand can do. You can train it to punch, you can train it to pick things up, you can train it to do virtually anything you can do with your hand. And people who lose their hands learn this very fast. So it's like a new paradigm. When you first start, start trying to pick things up with your feet or to try to use your feet to uh, manipulate or to punch with or to whatever, you, you just, like, you're just all discombobulated. Now these are just sort of physical things. You can do this in the area of eating. You can do this in the area of um, your relationships. Most of our relationships are a function of paradigms. We relate to each other in the way that we have been told is the only way that you can relate. And so when someone else says something to us that we find offensive, we immediately respond with anger. And that's a paradigm. In Everyday Wisdom, this little book of quotes, my favorite quote in there is this whole idea that if you really want to improve the quality of your relationships, whatever you're paid to get in, in here tonight, just this one little sentence will really dramatically alter your, uh, your uh, relationships. And I'm not just talking about the person that you live with. I'm talking about people that you meet on the street, people that um, you work with, people that uh, wait on you in restaurants, whomever they are. When you have the choice, and you always do, to be right, or to be kind. Just pick kind. It's a whole new paradigm. I no longer have to be right. Whew. Now there is a shift in awareness <laughs> that will lead you to higher consciousness. Someone says, you really are an asshole. <laughs> and you say, I appreciate you pointing that out. <laughs> you know, I really do behave like a jerk a lot. <laughs> And having someone to point it out to me really probably will help me to transcend that. 
It's very nice of you. It's very... The subtitle of my new book is called Making the Decision to be Free. Making the Decision to be Free. Now, freedom, the best definition I ever heard of freedom was offered by Florinda Donner in a wonderful book called Being in Dreaming. And Florinda Donner defined it this way. She said, freedom is the absolute lack of concern about yourself. Now that's freedom. When I was walking with uh, Marianne Williamson in Melbourne, Australia just a few months ago, we toured the uh, Australia speaking down there. And uh, we went for a walk one day. My daughter, my oldest daughter, was babysitting her little girl, Emma. And we went for a walk for about two or three hours, just talking about the tour and what we were going to do on, this, on the programs and all of that. And she said to me, out of nowhere, she said, come on, Wayne. She said, tell me, do you uh, have any secret desires? Just like... Now, there was a time when, when someone asked me that question in a park, you know, a woman, I would have uh, come up with a, sort of a crass remark. But I said, yes, I do have secret desires. She said, what is it? I said, I would like to disappear and still be here. And I remember reading in some of Castaneda's later works saying that freedom is really a disappearing act. It's like you have to learn how to disappear your ego. And the absolute lack of concern about yourself and how things affect you and how self-absorbed you are and how important you are and, and their need to be right all the time and all of that. This is all stuff that is part of a paradigm that we have been taught because we believe in this, ego, which stands for edging God out. <laughs> Our ego is the part of us that is our false self. And I say that without qualification. It is the part of us that would have us believe that we are separate from, that we are more important than, that we are special. And I want to tell you right now, folks, if you want to understand higher awareness, you've got to get off of this thing that you are special. You are not special in the eyes of God or anyone else. It implies if you're special that someone else is not, doesn't it? And if everyone is special, then we don't need a word like that, do we? <laughs> to specify who is and who isn't. We are all divine creations, extensions of God. Every single one of us. No one better, no one more important, no one more advanced, no one prettier, no one more anything. And this whole idea that we have been carrying around with us about what it is that offends us and what it is that we find difficult to live with and how, how important it is for us to be right and to make other people wrong, all of this stuff is an absence of higher awareness. And you've got to somehow figure out a way to transcend it. And know and begin to believe in something that you can't see. Believe in something that you can't see. I wrote a story. I'm going to share just a part of it with you. It's a story that I open up this uh, Your Sacred Self with. The story goes like this. Imagine this scene. Two babies are in utero, womb mates. <laughs> Confined to the wall of their mother's womb and they are having a conversation. Okay, just willingly suspend, just let this in, okay? Two little twins having a conversation. For the sake of clarity, we'll call these twins ego and spirit. Spirit says to ego, I know you're going to find this difficult to accept, but I truly believe there is life after birth. 
Ego responds, don't be ridiculous, look around you. This is all there is. Why must you always be thinking about something beyond this reality? Why don't you just accept your lot in life? Make yourself comfortable. Forget about all these life after birth nonsense. Go in the corner and grab your cord and knock it off. <laughs> Spirit quiets down for a while, but her inner voice won't allow her to remain silent any longer. <clears throat> Ego, now don't get mad, but I have something else to say. I also believe that there is a mother. A what? A mother. <laughs> a mother? How can you be so absurd? You've never seen a mother. Why can't you accept that this is all there is? The idea of a mother is crazy. You are here, alone, with me. This is your reality. It's wet. It's cold. It's crowded. This is it. Trust me, there is no mother. Trust me. Spirit reluctantly stops her conversation with ego, but her restlessness soon gets the better of her ego, she implores. Now, listen, without rejecting my, my idea, just listen. Somehow I think that those constant pressures that we both feel, you know, those movements that make us so uncomfortable, that continual repositioning and all of that closing in that seems to be taking place as we keep on growing, that this is all getting us ready for a place of glowing light, and we're going to experience it very soon. Now I know you're insane, replies Ego. All you've ever known is darkness. You've never seen light. How can you even contemplate such an idea? Those movements, those pressures you feel, these are your reality. You are a distinct, separate being. This is your journey. Darkness and pressures and a closed-in feeling, this is what life is all about. You're going to have to fight it as long as you live. Now grab your cord and stay still. Spirit relaxes for a while, but finally she can contain herself no longer. Ego, I have only one more thing to say, and then I'll never bother you again. Go ahead, Ego responds. Go ahead, impatiently. I believe all of these pressures and all of this discomfort is not only going to bring us a new celestial light, but when we experience it, we are going to meet Mother face to face and know an ecstasy that is beyond anything we've ever experienced up until now. You really are crazy, spirit. Now I'm convinced of it. And so you see the metaphor, don't you? I don't even have to explain it. We we who come to talks like this are what um, my friend Stuart Wilde calls fringe dwellers. We are dwelling on the fringe, all of us. We are filling out the forms. We are in the system. We are not that rebellious yet. We receive a lot of criticism. A lot of people think we're nuts. And I want to tell you, all of those people who do will be down this road with you before long, as soon as we get it paved. And while it's still rough, those who don't want to travel rough roads will be your critics. But most of us are sort of living what Jesus talked about when he said to uh, be in the world but not of the world. And so all of us here in this room know in our hearts that we are on a path that um, can't be stopped. And it's a very powerful force within us. And it motivates us not only to come to things like this but to behave in new ways and to break out of old paradigms. We also know that there is something more to this life that we are here experiencing other than just being a part of the system and we are going to have a deeper 
richer experience of life. We know it's available. We know that it doesn't matter what the system says. And that we are going to be what I call scurvy elephants. When I was a little boy living in an orphanage, I came home and said to the lady who ran the place, what's a scurvy elephant? And she said, oh, what? I said, I heard my third grade teacher telling the principal that Wayne Dyer was in her classroom and that he was a scurvy elephant. She said, I don't know what that is, but I'll call. And she called the principal and the principal said, oh, no, that's Wayne. He gets everything mixed up. She didn't say that he was a scurvy elephant in her classroom. She said that he was a disturbing element in her classroom. <laughs> And so we usually have a house full of them when I speak. <laughs> and your karmic payoff is usually that if you are one yourself, you get two or three of them uh, to raise. I got eight. <laughs> and so knowing that there is a deeper and a richer experience of life available to us, us fringe dwellers who are sort of in the world, but we're not of the world, we know this is not home. This is not our home. We know it. We know that we are not human beings having a spiritual experience, but that it's the other way around. That we are all spiritual beings having a human experience. We know this. And we know that there was a moment when we, before we showed up here on this plane, when we were in nowhere. N-O-W-H-E-R-E. -E. Nowhere. And this is the moment just before your conception. I'm going to suggest to you, and I know this is weird, put a little asterisk around this in the tape. I'm going to suggest to you that you don't rely upon your memory to determine whether this is valid or not. Because you probably can't even tell me what you had for breakfast. Let alone what you dreamt about last night. Let alone what happened to you when you were three months old. You all were three months old, weren't you, at one time? You want to tell me about it? What was it like? What was the color of your crib sheets? Your memory is not a good indicator of whether something is true or not true. And my experience with the teachers that I have had and with my own meditative practices and with my own reading is that we sign up for all of this and that there are no accidents. That, that God's plan works and yours doesn't by and large. And if you want yours to work, make it the same as God's and understand that. And that when you are in nowhere, you make a decision to come here. And you pick who you're coming here with. And so if you don't like who you got, you ought to be wondering why you picked them. <laughs> and when you left nowhere, and we all leave nowhere, N O W-H-E-R-E, -E, and we get to now here, N-O-W-H-E-R-E, -E, and it's all the same. It's just a question of spacing. So we go from nowhere to now here. And guess where you're headed? Back to nowhere. And you know that <laughs> because you have been watching the journey, haven't you? Because whoever you are, has been in a whole lot of bodies already. In fact, even how you got here from nowhere to now here is exactly the same for all of us. Like it or not, you all started out the same. You went on a picnic with your father, you came home with your mother. That's the way it gets. Okay? I don't care if you're a nun, I don't care if you're the Pope, I don't care who you are, there was a picnic. <laughs> and now you show up in now here. And you show up in a room. And the room is this reality that you are experiencing. And we call it daily awareness. And you show up in this house, this beautiful house, in this little room called daily awareness. And the only way you can get into the house is through your birth and you squeeze into this room okay 
and you spend your time here, whatever time that you have signed up for, some of us for 10 weeks, some of us for 10 years, some of us for 100 years, and it's all in divine order, even though we milk this melodrama of death to death, somehow believing that it shouldn't be happening and isn't it awful and... You know, and we don't even believe in it anymore, and that's the ego. The ego's greatest disappointment and embarrassment is death. All right? And it does everything that it possibly can to avoid the embarrassment of dying. It will even stick tubes in you and feed you through funny little things, all of, you know, whatever. And God's saying, why don't, why don't you come home now? And say, well, they won't get these damn tubes out of me. And they got this, you know. And so we milk this and milk this and milk this and, and, and don't understand that it's in divine order. It's all in divine order. And then you leave the room at your death and the door snaps shut. And you live your life here in this room called daily awareness. And I would like to suggest to you that all the rest of the house is something called higher awareness. And very few people know how to get out of this room of daily awareness. They don't get out of it because they are looking around and looking around for the door. <laughs> and they spend their life trying to find the door out. And they're pushing and they're pushing and they're pushing. And then one day they have this stunning realization. And the realization is that the door to the other room opens inward. <laughs> inward. It doesn't open out. You can't push it out. You've got to step back and let it in. And one of the things that I promote, and I don't do a lot of commercials, but this is one I do for, uh, commercial for. It's called For the Love of God. And it's a collection of writings that, was, um, that I was uh, asked to participate in called For the Love of God. And they ask about 30 of us from around the planet if we would write our own personal interpretations of God. They ask the Dalai Lama. They ask Mother Teresa, who I think is a living saint. They ask myself, who is nowhere as close to it. They ask Brooke Medicine Ego. Matthew Fox, Shakti Gawain, Ken Kais, Harold Kushner, Stephen Levine, Hugh Prather, many others, if they would write their own contributions. And here is one person who I admire a great deal, a Buddhist. His name is Joseph Goldstein. I think he's a convert. <laughs> and he says, the first time I sat in meditation was for just five minutes. But even that glimpse was exciting and transformative. By the way, there are no profits made on this book. There are no royalties paid on this book. All of the money earned on this book goes to ending world hunger. He says, um, it opened up a new possibility of understanding. He says, I saw that almost everything I had ever studied had been an exploration of externals. This experience of meditation turned my attention around. It gave me a sense that there is actually a path through inner experience. And this has been borne out in ways I had never dreamed of at the time. That's a very, very powerful notion about this house and going from nowhere to now here. Now, there is a path through inner experience, and it has been borne out in ways for me. Marcella, for you. Um, in ways that I had never dreamt of at the time. In order to know this path, you can't read about it. You can't have somebody else tell you about it. It's like the difference between knowing about God and knowing God. A lot of us know about God from what we've had handed to us through the various paradigms that we have bought into in our lives. Very few of us know God directly, have a direct knowing of the experience of saying, I now know. Like it says in A Course in Miracles, if you knew, it doesn't say if you believed, it says if you knew who walked beside you at all times on this path that you have chosen, you could never experience fear again. And when my teacher said, go out into the night, go knowing that you're not alone. Pat McMahon, who many of you know on KTAR and who's a dear friend of mine for years and years, 20 years now, told me about his, when, when Mother Teresa was here in town and that he asked if there was anything that he could do to help her with her cause because she was 
trying to raise the consciousness and, and to create this shelter. And he said, can I help you raise money? Can I, uh, can I promote anything that you're doing? And, uh, and she said, no, 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 you don't understand. And they had her put up at uh, um, Andre House, is it Andre House? Is that, uh, what is that, at the homeless place here in uh, Phoenix? And she thought it was too extravagant. She wanted something, she, you know, she, they put her in a room that had carpeting in it. She said, no, that's, that, I don't, don't need carpet. I mean, she was, this is someone who has really transcended her ego. And, she, and he said, well, what can I do? He said, go out into the street and find someone who thinks that they're alone and let them know they're not. Let them know they're not. And when you have this knowing, this knowing that um, you are not alone, and you can experience it, and hopefully by the end of this evening you will have a, sort of a tool to do that, you will have a whole different perception of it. You see, I said earlier that after the picnic, you're in the room, and you're now here. And all the time that you've been here up until now, for me, it's 54 years. I, was, I, came, I showed up here uh, May the 10th, 1940. Right. Good year, right? I went back to my high school reunion in the 30s. There's all those old people there. I didn't understand what they were doing there. And it is now 1995. So, but who I am has been watching this take place. Now, this is one of the things that you have to do in order to erase your past, is that you have to know that who you are is not this thing that you have shown up in, which is on its way back to nowhere. But indeed, who you are is that which has been observing it. So it's like, instead of being the person who is that which is being noticed, you become the noticer. You are not that which you notice. You are that which is noticing. And that is ages. Now, in all of those spiritual texts that I talked about in writing and reading before your sacred self, uh, in the Course in Miracles, in the, New, in the New Testament, in the Kabbalah, in the Bhagavad Gita, all of those spiritual masters said the same thing when they were asked to define reality when they were asked to define what is real. And guess what the definition of what is reality? Reality is that which never changes, period. That which never changes. So what part of you can you point to that never changes? What part of you is ageless? I mean, how old is the noticer? How old is the observer? How old is the witness? Or how old is that which you've been witnessing? Fifty-four and a half years for me. But the one that's been watching it hasn't aged at all. It's still exactly the same inside. Still processing. Do it. Now, I have really learned, and one of and my very favorite letter that I've ever received about all of this came to me from a little scurvy elephant in Crossett, Arkansas. This is a teacher, her name is Gail Thomas, and she wrote me this letter. She says, Dear Dr. Dyer, as a class assignment, I ask my sixth grade gifted, talented students to write about something in our gifted class. My idea was that they would write about some of the material we had covered during the week. She said, I do give the children a certain leeway with my direction, but I was completely taken by surprise when Ronnie Terrell, a fidgety boy in my last period class wrote this jewel. I had your book, The Sky's the Limit, with your full picture on it propped up on my chalk tray, and obviously this is what caught Ronnie's eye. She says, I've seen you many times on The Tonight Show and felt that with your sense of humor, you would love this. <laughs> this is Ronnie Terrell's impressions of the class after looking at my picture for one week. <laughs> this is little smartass Ronnie 
Cheryl. He says in his essay, Dr. Wayne Dyer is slick-headed. His barber was probably drunk or he was caught by an Indian. Then he has this wonderful line that only a little scurvy elephant in the last row could write, I know, because I was one. He says, I wonder if flies slide off of his head. Is that great or not? He says, I bet he was once a magician and he did a disappearing act and he came back but his hair forgot to. He says, poor man, his wife used to bring him home gallons of head and shoulders and now she comes home with mop and glow. Mop and glow, all right? So that's Ronnie Terrell's impressions of the classic. But you see, this doesn't bother me because this isn't me. I am just the watcher. As a matter of fact, I've even learned, after I turned 50, I learned that hair doesn't fall out anyway. I used to have like these metaphysical questions I would ask my wife. I'd hold one up in the morning that was on the pillow. I'd say, honey, a thousand dollars if you can answer this question. She said, what are you talking about? I said, what, what held it in yesterday? You know, it's like, <laughs> something did, right? But now I've learned, you see. When you turn 50, if you, those of you who are suffering with this, uh, I learned that hair doesn't fall out. It's amazing. You don't lose your hair. This would be great insight for you. It actually goes in. And then it comes out in your nose and your ears when you turn 50. My kids got me an electric nose and ear hair clipper for Christmas. If I didn't have that today, I would have shoulder length ear hair, you know, coming. So I've been noticing this for a long time, you see. And all of you have been noticing the same thing. And it's like noticing, being the difference between the noticer and that which you notice. And that which you notice. This is the crucial, this is like the real crucial test to understanding higher awareness. You know that when you go back to nowhere, the moment before you go back to nowhere, if they weigh your body and it weighs 150 pounds, and then life leaves your body, and then they weigh this thing that they're going to burn, and it still weighs 150 pounds, the same as it did when life was in it, you know there's some part of you, some intellectual part of you tells you that if you weigh the same alive or dead, that your life, when it leaves your body, is weightless. That what it is that constitutes your life doesn't weigh anything. It's in a different dimension. You know that there's a command center inside of you that says, hey, I'm going to wiggle my finger. Hey, I'm going to dance this. I'm going to hold this microphone. There's a command center that says you have a thought, and then the thought gets translated into something physical. And you can find that by doing an autopsy on a brain. You can find that command center in the cerebellum of the brain. But there's no autopsy on this planet that will ever reveal the commander in the command center that says, I'm going to wiggle my finger. I'm going to hold this microphone. I'm going to move my foot. And that's who you are. That which never changes. And if you ask any of the spiritual masters who've ever walked among us, any teacher that will come your way, they will teach you that reality is the part of you that is eternal. And when you live there, you abide in an absence of fear. And you begin to know that life itself is a sublime experience. And there are no accidents in it at all. That this is an intelligent system that we are all a part of. And that intelligence, whatever you want to call it, flows through each and every one of us. And the same intelligence that moves a star across the sky moves a thought across your mind. The same intelligence allows the seedlings to sprout. And will take a little seedling and have treeness in it, just as a little drop of human protoplasm has Eunice in it. 
and it has a future pull. And the whole physical domain is handled in that drop of human protoplasm. When you will show up and when you will leave. It's all in there. The thing that makes you a member of something called higher awareness is that you, unlike a tulip bulb, which has its future pull built into the bulb, you get to decide. You get to decide on the pictures. And you get to determine what your life truly is, not what this garage where you park your soul is all about. And to understand this, go to the poets. We were doing a tour, a backpack thing, with my wife and two, and two other couples this summer in Haleakala in Maui, this dormant uh, volcano. And you go down in there and you, and you hike for three days. It's a wonderful experience. It's, it's like the closest you can get to being on another planet, I think. It's very silent and, uh, and the terrain looks like God has just sort of reached down and placed each object in there. It's a, it's a very peaceful, beautiful place. And it's all volcanic dust. And when we got one day in, and we all sat down to do a group meditation, I picked up a handful of this volcanic dust, and I said, would you like to... I used to teach this, this poetry, and, and uh, I've written a lot of it myself. And I, I said, would you like to hear what Emily Dickinson had to say about this in a poem that she wrote in 1914 called A Single Hound? And we all sat around, and we meditated, and I held this dust in my hand, I said, listen, listen to Emily Dickinson, and listen to this, and think about you as the noticer and as that which is being noticed, what you've been watching as you send your body back to nowhere, and what part of you is real and what part isn't. She said, this quiet dust was gentlemen and ladies and lads and girls, was laughter and ability and sighing and frocks and curls. This passive place, a summer's nimble mansion where bird and bees fulfilled their oriental circuit, then ceased like these. Think of this room filled with all of these people here tonight. And think a thousand years into the future. And listen to her words again. This quiet dust was gentlemen and ladies and lads and girls. Was laughter and ability and sighing and frocks and curls. You see, if your primary identification is with this thing called your body, then you are destined to a life of fear. If you know that who you are in a state of heightened awareness is not this raw material, it's as if this organizing intelligence we'll call God has taken all of this raw material and organized it into various levels of awareness. Here are some rocks, here are some plants, here are some animals, here are human beings. All made up of the same stuff. It's not the raw material that separates us from all other life. It's something called awareness. And this heightened awareness that we have a capacity, most of us live our lives at the awareness level of survival. The awareness level of daily awareness in this room where the animals live. Just sort of taking care of their offspring and providing for themselves and planning a little bit for the future and putting a little bit away. And the idea of a higher level of awareness doesn't even enter our consciousness. We're satisfied to survive, except for the fringe dwellers who say there is a deeper, richer experience of life. I know it. And just because you who are in my life are not on my path, not only are they not on your path, they're not even on an entrance ramp to your path. <laughs> And they probably won't be. And that's divine too. That's perfect. That's here to teach you to be kind, not to be right.
because the biggest, there's no bullshit like new age bullshit, okay? <laughs> and new age bullshit is the bullshit that says, I am spiritually superior to you. <laughs> That's the ego talking big time. <laughs> None of us are spiritually superior to any of the rest of us. We are all here on purpose, looking for a way to serve. See, we come in with nothing. And we're here, and we leave. And our life here is a parenthesis in eternity. It opens parentheses, it closes parentheses, and we go out with nothing. And this is an intelligent system that we're in. So uh, in an intelligent system, when you come in with nothing and leave with nothing, the reason for being here has to have something to do with the opposite of getting. Because getting means trying to hang on to it. And that's an illusion. It's not real. It isn't real unless it never changes. And everything that you want to hang on to is. So that the purpose, the only thing you can do with your life is give it away. And when you know that you're here not to get, but the opposite of that, to give. My mantra before I come out on a stage like this is how may I serve? I, I started at 5 o'clock. <laughs> and I said it until 20 to 7. Over and over and over again in my hotel room. How may I serve? 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 That's what we're here for. And this process of intention of being able to eradicate and erase our past, this process works like this. Let's go for a moment to our dream. And just assume that we're going to have a dream. We're in bed. And let me ask you this question. This is a question I like to ask for you to just contemplate, one of those sort of cones. When you go to sleep at night and enter your dream state, what happens to the bed? Just think about that. What happens to the bed? Now you're in your dream, okay? So just propel yourself into a dream state. And in your dream, you notice, oh, let's say you're over here and you're in a room. And in this room, you look across the room and you notice that there's a podium in the room and it has some objects on it. Now you're in your dream. So in the state of dream consciousness, you say to yourself, I would like to examine that podium more closely. How do you do it in your dream? How do you examine it more closely in your dream state? Do you get out of bed? Is there a bed? Now, we're talking about one-third of your life here, folks, okay? One-third of your life. As Lao Tzu said, I went to sleep and dreamt that I was a butterfly. Then I woke up, and now I don't know. Am I a man who dreamt he was a butterfly, or am I a butterfly who's dreaming that he's a man? <laughs> so in your dream state, do you get up out of bed? Keep it right over there. Say, excuse me, honey, uh, wait, uh, get up. And walk over and say, oh, here, oh, there's a galley of a new book, and there's a pen here, and there's some glass of water. I think I'll have a drink of that. There's a microphone stand. There's things. Do you do that? No, you don't do that. Because you enter your dream without any doubt. So what you do in your dream state is, are you ready? Shoo! Stay alert. <laughs> And you bring it to you, don't you? In your dream state. Why? Because you have the power of your intention, can have an idea, and whatever you need for the fulfillment of your dream, you bring to you. Here it is. Here it is. Whatever you need. So you're 20 years old in your dream, and you need a jerk to be married to for the next 20 years. There he is. Isn't that great? You need a Maserati? There it is. Whatever you need for the dream, you bring to it. Then you leave the dream and you come into waking consciousness. And now you look back on the dream and you now have a whole new set of things that you've introduced. And that set of things is called doubt. 
And the second key to higher awareness, which I'll get to shortly, is called banishing the doubt, but it's, it's connected here. As you enter your dream state, you enter without any doubt about your capacity to do anything. So you can fly, you can jump over trees, you can be young again, you can uh, transcend death, you can stay underwater, you can, do, you can uh, communicate telepathically with anyone that you want to, right? You have all of these incredible powers. And if someone has died and you want them back, shoop, you bring them back. If you need to be 12 again, shoop. and then you come into this state and you say, I can't do any of those things because you're stuck in paradigms. And the paradigm says, you cannot change your shape. You can't shape shift. If you're a certain age, you're a certain age. You can't move yourself into, you can't be in more than one place at the same time, which you can do in your dream easily. You can't do those things. And one of the things I talk about in your sacred self is like learning to become a waking dreamer, to understand that you don't have to go to sleep in order to dream. So now you wake up, and what I'm suggesting to you is that this is also a dream, only it's a hundred year dream. And in this hundred year dream, everything that you can do in your eight hour dream, you can do in this hundred year dream. Everything. If you know better than to doubt it. And if you get rid of the paradigms that muck up your life. You have the capacity. But the minute that you introduce doubt into it, like that poem that I started out, Real Magic, which is really my effort to write about how to manifest miracles in your life. From Samuel Taylor Coleridge, he said, what if you slept? And what if in your sleep you dreamed? And what if in your dream you went to heaven and there picked a strange and wonderful flower? And what if when you awoke, you held that flower in your hand? Ah, what then? Is it possible to bring something from a dream state into a waking state? Or is that part of a paradigm? And the tiniest smidgen of doubt that enters your consciousness is what you will act upon. Seven key little words from Proverbs, as you think, so shall you be. If you think that it's not possible, what you think about is what expands. Or as Emerson said, the, at the ancestor to every action is a thought. And the minute you have a doubtful thought in your consciousness, you will act upon that and manifest the fruit of that doubt and not be able to see it. You will not see it. So what I'm suggesting to you is that whatever it is that you know is right for you. And this has been called many things. This power, this force, that flows through all of us. You are in for such an incredible treat right now. One of the words that is used to describe this force is grace. And in a great hymn, probably one, I think the greatest song ever written by a person who had nothing, who was struggling in his life, who just jotted it down on the back of an envelope. It's called Amazing Grace. And in Amazing Grace, there are words that say, I once was lost, but now I'm found. And it was grace that taught my heart to feel. It was grace that brought me home. In touring Australia, we toured with a young singer named Cecilia. Cecilia was the first person in the 168-year history of the Oslo Conservatory of Music in Norway. She's Norwegian, from the land of the midnight sun. To ever receive an absolutely perfect score on all facets of voice, including the ability to reach the 10th octave, which only three or four people on the planet are capable of doing, and to do something called... Um, creating what we call the purple. You'll notice as you sing, as you hear her sing Amazing Grace, that there's a, there's a moment when she is able to shift colors if you close your eyes into what they call the purple range. 
Her CD is available here. It's called The Voice of the Feminine Spirit. Eight of the songs on here were written by Stuart Wilde, my dear friend. All of the funds of this, and you'll want it, <laughs> go to uh, her, not to me. And you will nev you've never heard anybody sing this song like this. The sounds that you hear at the beginning are the sounds of the whales. Getting them into the studio and uh, <laughs> getting the earphones on them was the only hard part they had in producing this tape. But I'd like you to hear the voice of the next superstar on this planet singing the voice of the feminine spirit. And just close your eyes and listen to Cecilia as she sings Amazing Grace. And then I'll talk about this when we're done. It takes four minutes.
Amazing grace. Isn't that powerful? It's stunning. It's stunning. And that grace, that whatever you want to call that force that flows through all of us, is basically, essentially, what your higher self is. Now I want to give you a practical application of how this power of grace and intention works in your life. As you know from how I opened, I'm out in the streets, wherever I am, early in the morning, with grace. And I was walking the other morning, not yesterday, but the day before, over in this um, place, sort of kitty corner from here, a place where they have a tribute to Cesar Chavez, uh, some kind of a garden spot. And, uh, and I saw a woman walking about 5 o'clock in the morning, 5.30. And I thought it's strange to see a woman out here alone, walking, long hair, unescorted. And she was at a drinking fountain. And so something propelled me toward this woman. I don't know what it was. And I walked over to uh, where she was working this drinking fountain, and it didn't seem to work right. And she turned it on and got a drink, and then I was behind her, and I tried to get the thing on, and I couldn't get it on. And she said, uh, she turned around to me. She said, oh, nobody can work this fountain. She said, only my daughter, who's 12, knows how to work this thing. This is my water stop. So she got, with two of us sort of fumbled around with it, and we got it to work, and I took a drink, and I said, where are you going at this time of the morning? She said, um, I'm going up to the uh, plasma center to sell blood. She said, I go there two or three times a week, and my husband goes the other days, and that's uh, one of the ways that we uh, make our money, by selling our blood, the plasma. First time you do it, you get $20 or $25. The next time you do it, you get $10. And you do it um, as frequently as you can because um, I have to raise some money. I said, well, let me walk up there with you. And we walked and we were talking. And I was talking to her about uh, some of the things that um, I'll even be talking about here later this evening. I told her about this term, this Japanese term called satorai which means instant awakening and how you don't have to uh, have a long time to learn something. You can have a moment. And she said, well, I'm uh, uh, married to a, uh, a man, an Englishman, but uh, my background is, uh, is Indian. I'm an Aleut Indian, and we have a name for that in Aleut. And I asked her to write it down. I said, what does it mean? She said, it means... Uh, Great seeing. Turns out this woman had gone, been to Berkeley, been to UCLA, has a 12-year-old daughter, and um, the daughter has had some physical problems. And we got up, and we talked for, well, we must have walked for half an hour or so. And I felt very peaceful with this woman. I felt I was really in the company of, of a very special divine being. And she was very concerned about my safety. <laughs> Began to lecture me about not getting hurt. And she said, if you look at some of these people that are standing out here, the sun was just coming up. She said, you'll see that the spirit has left them. They still have bodies, but they have no spirit. It's sort of just abandoned them. And, and when people have no spirit, they can act in dangerous ways. It's a spiritual deficit. And we talked and... Uh, we got up close to the plasma center and there were a whole bunch of people standing up there who were going to sell their blood to make whatever money they were going to make for the day. And I just had a strong feeling that um, she shouldn't go in there this day. And I said to her, um, I'll tell you what, I had a little bit of money on me and I reached and I had a hundred dollar bill in my pocket. And I said, here, take this hundred dollars and go back home. And don't go into that place today. I don't feel right about you going in there. And she said, no, I can't take that. And I said, no, just take it and just think of it as a gift. And so she put it in and she got sort of teary and she walked across the street. And I walked away for the one. I came back and she was standing there and she was doing some kind of a ceremony, an Indian ceremony. 
And I said, what were you doing over there under that light? And she said, I was, uh, she said, I was apologizing to God. Because I've always known that God will provide. And that Monday, yesterday, today, the uh, insurance that we absolutely have to have for my daughter to keep her treatments up on her physical maladies was, uh, was due today, tomorrow. This was Sunday morning. And my husband and I have been exchanging our dates down here at the Plasma Center so that we could raise the money to make this insurance premium. And the amount of that insurance premium that we have due tomorrow, that I had no idea how I was going to get, was $97. She said, you are a miracle that you showed up and handed me this. And there were many forces that operated there to get me to that place at that moment to talk to this person, to walk there, to be here. I wasn't even supposed to be here tonight. I filled in for Marianne, who wasn't able to be here and, uh, and who will be coming later. And uh, I even talked to her about it yesterday, her not being able to be here and my saying, I'll come. And Then she told me and warned me about going there and so on. And she said um, she has a problem with her teeth. And I said, you know, it'd really be great if you could get those teeth of yours fixed. And she said, uh, I know exactly what it costs to have my teeth fixed, and I'm going to get it done. But I don't know how yet, but I'm going to get it done. I said, how much is it? She said, $3,752. And I will manifest it. And I will no longer ever doubt God again. So I said to her, I said, look, um, I know you don't know who I am, but, um, and I'm out here in these running clothes and look like one of the people that lives out here. <laughs> I said, I'm speaking tomorrow night at Symphony Hall. Why don't you come as my guest? And I know there's going to be a dentist here. I know he's going to be there. And if he'll work at uh, his wages, I'll take care of that dental bill for you. I know we can get it done. She said, no, I can't come. She said, I take care of a 92-year-old woman, and uh, that's one of the things I have to do. And I said, well, if, you, if, if it works out. And when I walked in tonight, my secretary, Maya, was back there, and she said, uh, your friend came. And she's here. And I know she's probably a little embarrassed about what I'm saying, but uh, I feel compelled to introduce you to, I think, a spiritual being who really gave me much more than I gave her. She's sitting here in the front row. This is Marcella Whitehead. Stand up and say hello to these people. Come on, Marcella. Stand up. There's a lot of love in this room, and uh, we're going to get those teeth taken care of for you. One way or the other, it's going to get done. She won't let me do it. See? The people that are out there struggling are not the derelicts and the drunks that we all think they are. There are many, many divine souls out there. who just a while back were just a, uh, a paycheck away from having their own place. And in America, we've got to wake up to that and know what we're here for. She was able, through her intention, to bring her insurance payment to her through a stranger walking in the night. Now, what I'd like to say to you is that if you can imagine your life as like a boat and your boat is heading in this direction and while you're headed in this direction you are standing back here at the stern of the boat. Now just try to get a picture of that and as you look down into the water what do you see when you look into the water with the boat heading in that direction? You see 
The Wake, don't you? W A K E, The Wake. Now, three questions about The Wake. Number one, what is The Wake? The Wake is the trail that is left behind. That's what The Wake is. Second question, what is driving the ship? What is making it go? The answer, the present moment energy that is being generated by the engine is making the boat go in this direction. The third and most important question for getting rid of the past and opening yourself up to higher awareness. Is it possible for the wake to drive the ship? In reality, the answer is no. The wake is the trail that is left behind. And it cannot make the boat of your life go in this direction. The only thing that makes your life go, no matter how much you convince yourself to the contrary, no matter how much you're convinced that it had something to do with your birth order, or it had to do with your mama or your papa, or the fact that you were uh, an abandoned child, or the fact that your father was an alcoholic, or that your mother liked your sister better, and even if you don't have a sister, she wanted one, she would have liked her better. <laughs> No matter how much you get yourself convinced of all of the stuff that is in your past is why your life is going in this direction, it is all an illusion. It cannot drive the ship of your life. And you have got to let go of that idea that somehow why you are the way you are and what the circumstances of your life are have something to do with that trail that is left behind. What is responsible for where you are in your life and where you are going in your life is the present moment energy that you are generated, generating right now out of your consciousness. And where you place your attention is what you will manifest for yourself. And in reading the Kabbalah before going to over to Marco Island to write your sacred self, the thing that I got most out of the Kabbalah was this. It says in there that our purpose in being here on this planet is to move from one level to the next, from the physical level to the spiritual level. That's what we show up here for. That's what it means to be a spiritual being having a human experience. That we are here to move from one level to the next. And in order to be able to move from one level to the next, you must generate the energy to do so. Now energy is a very key concept, and this is another one of those weird little things. But I suggest to you that you not only have a physical body, but you also have an energy body. And that energy body is with you, it's a double. And that body double is with you at all times, it is surrounds you in a shape that is actually capable, you are capable of a great seeing. How do you say it, Marcella? Not Natoihe, a great seeing. And when you see this energy body, you will see that it is assembled around you in something called an assemblage point that is out back here someplace. And that that assemblage point of energy is what determines your agreement with reality. And your agreement with reality cannot be shifted until you move that assemblage point of energy. And you, are, you can indeed move that energy. And when you are able to shift that energy that is who you are and shift it, you can experience and create and write a new agreement with reality which allows you to make a somersault into the unimaginable. And energy is not something that is visible. This planet is soaring through space, it is orbiting, it weighs trillions and trillions of tons, it is being held up and, and moving forward and circling all the time, and something is holding it up and something is making it spin and something is making it move, something called energy that is also flowing through you and everything on this spinning oblate spheroid. It's all moving and spinning, and you know that from your science classes. And that energy is also that invisible energy 
is something that you have, an etheric energy body that you can learn to tap into. Shift that energy around. There's different ways of doing it. And as you learn to do it through meditative practices, you start to have a a great seeing, an epiphany. Satorai. An instant awakening. And when you are able to generate the energy, and the Kabbalah says, not only do you have to generate an incredible amount of energy in order to be able to go from one level to the next, but this is the aha, this is the eureka. Ready? That the only way, according to the Kabbalah, that you can generate the energy to move to the higher level is through a fall. A fall. F-A-L-L. -L. I was a high jumper in the track team in high school. They set the bar up here, five foot six. I'm white, okay? White guys can't jump. <laughs> I run up to the bar. I get down as low as I can. And in the process of getting down low, falling, I generate the energy to propel myself over the bar. That's how you high jump. In order to move from a lower level to a higher level, you have to fall to generate the energy. The same thing the Kabbalah says is true for all of us in our lives, and that every advancement in spiritual consciousness is preceded by a fall. And the ego is terrified of a fall. <laughs> because the ego will die if you find God. The ego is that false idea that you are separate, better, more important, prettier, more stronger, wealthier, better, all of those kinds of things that you have to constantly keep proving yourself to. Your higher self says, just be at peace. Your ego says, more is better. Your ego says, there is no peace in more is better. And if it promotes peace, then it's your higher self. If it promotes turmoil, it's your ego. So the ego just sort of likes to promote a sort of steady river of misery. <laughs> Because it knows, ego knows that if you fall, that's when you will find God. And who doesn't when you fall? I mean, a breakup, an accident, a stroke, a heart attack, a bankruptcy, a divorce, a separation, a loss of a job. Anything that constitutes, quote, a fall makes you a gentler, kinder, more God-like, more Christ-like, more Buddha-like soul. And when you then go there, you generate the energy to move to the next level. So what, why aren't we taught, why are we in a paradigm that falls are bad? Instead of being in a paradigm that says a fall gives me the opportunity to generate the energy I need to get to the next level, and I probably can't get there without it. William Blake put it in poetry, in Songs of Innocence, better than I can ever say it. He said, man was made for joy and woe. And when this we rightly know, through the world we safely go. Joy and woe are woven fine. A clothing for the soul divine. <laughs> And everybody you've ever known who's had an accident, who's had a breakup, who's had one of these things happen to them, that they generally find themselves in a higher place. And if you can get there now without the need to have a trauma, you can begin to experience all of the things that are happening in your life as part of this divine intelligence. And they no longer then become part of suffering. As Nisargadatta says, you do not suffer. Only the person you imagine yourself to be suffers. Who you are. And when you go, learn to live there, you can just witness the suffering. And it no longer even is that. It's very wise words from the Kabbalah. People have been handing me money and things to give to Marcella, so 
I appreciate that, and she does as well. It's very kind of you. One man who came here from India in the early part of this century, his name was uh, Vivekananda. Um, he came here to, um, he was sent here really, and uh, showed up in Boston, um, I think 1910, and wrote some beautiful things. He's really one of India's great saints. And he had these to say, I use this at the beginning of the third part of Your Sacred Self. He said, the blossom vanishes of itself as the fruit grows, so will your lower self vanish as the divine grows within you. Just like a blossom vanishes as the fruit emerges, so will the lower self vanish as the divine grows within you. And the divine is not um, some religious message, some orthodox thing that you have to memorize. The divine is um, that thing that Pierre Teilhard called the glue that holds the entire universe together, something called love. And that's what it's really all about. And this love is really the very thing that um, holds your life together. Did you ever think about like uh, the moment that you uh, die and head back to nowhere, um, that your body begins to disintegrate? This thing turns into dust, and uh, the instant that life leaves it, it starts to... So what is it that was holding it together and keeping it from doing that? There is something holding you together and keeping it from just, like, turning into dust. And that thing that holds it together and allows you to be whole is this force that is invisible and in another dimension. And it's getting to know this force that is um, at the uppermost in my consciousness. Um, and when you understand that when you come to trust in yourself or trust in this inner divine part of yourself that is not physical, when you trust in the noticer rather than that which you notice, That you're really, when you come to trust in yourself, you're really trusting in the very wisdom that created you. You become one with the universal wisdom that is your creator, that brought you from the picnic to the room and leaving the room. Now what I want to talk about here in this uh, last half hour or so is um, how to get out of this room while you're here. You see, most of us are living in a paradigm that says the only way out of the room of daily awareness is through death. So the door opens for a split second and in you come at your conception and you're here and then one split second it opens and then closes again and you die. And I would like to suggest that that somersault into the unimaginable, if you will, is really just opening this door. And I use this illustration, this is my key to my room at the hotel across the street. Imagine myself in a room, in a house, but the house has no electricity, it's dark. But there's electricity outside on the street. So I'm in the house and I'm fumbling around and I drop my key. And I notice that it's dark. So in my infinite wisdom, <clears throat> I say, only a fool would grope around in the dark looking for his key in the house. I'm going outside under the street light where it's light. <laughs> and I'm going to look for my key. So I'm out here and I'm looking and I'm looking under the light and I look for... 20 minutes or so, and a friend comes along and says, what are you doing, Wayne? I say, oh, I lost my key. Well, here, I'll help you find it. And we look again for another 15 minutes and can't find it. Finally, he says to me, Wayne, he said, what? Tell me, he said, um, where did you drop your key? I said, well, what's that got to do with anything? <laughs> I dropped my key in the house, but the electricity's off. It's dark in there, and I'm not going to look around in the dark for my key. I came out here under the light to look for it. You mean to tell me that you dropped your key in the house and you're looking for it out here? Yeah. 
And you snicker and you realize how absurd that is, don't you? <laughs> and yet, isn't that exactly what we do when we have a problem that is located inside and we're looking for the solution out here in someone or something having to change in order for the problem to go away. See, what we have to learn to do is abandon the paradigm that other people or other things or other circumstances are responsible for our life and instead know that we chose it and we must learn to develop an inner candle flame that never flickers though the worst goes before us. And that inner candle flame tells us in our logical mind that if I have a problem inside, then the solution has to be where the problem is. So I will stop looking out here for the solutions to anything that's going on in my life that isn't working and begin to ask myself, how am I processing my world? And some of the things, you know, when I was a young, younger father in my 20s and early 30s, uh, my daughter Tracy, um, who was born in 1967, would be uh, with me. And there was an, uh, a series of albums that came out back in the 70s by a man whom I think is a great poet, a great musician. His name is Jackson Brown. Uh, and his early, his early songs just touched me, seemed to just touch my soul. I used to play them over and over and over again with her in the car. And of course... Um, she would always want to have something else playing. She used to say, you know, get a life, you know. I used to say back to her, get an afterlife, you know. Uh, it's like, she didn't really want to hear any of this stuff that I'm talking about now, even though I dedicated Erroneous Zones to her and all that. It's like, that was, you know, she had sort of a posture that she would assume, you know, and it was like uh, the hip would go out and the leg would go up and down. And you know, I have six daughters, so I mean, you, <clears throat> you know, when you're just sort of intolerable. You know, it's like when the hip goes out and it does, it's a genetic thing. And when this leg starts going up and down very fast, you are lost as far as reaching them. And when the head goes back and the eyes roll and it's like, and the leg goes faster, it's like, Dad, enough with the positive stuff, you know, and it's like, which is what she used to do to me all the time. I used to say to her, Tracy, honey, I like, why don't you come to where I'm speaking? I've, uh, you know, there's people actually pay to hear me speak. <laughs> you know, I can get you a seat right down front, you know. Why don't you come tomorrow night? She'd say, one word. Why? <laughs> you know, so, this was sort of what I was dealing with, and I still do. I mean, I get nice ovations out here, but believe me, when I get home, <clears throat> I know my place, all right? <laughs> and I used to play this one particular album, it was called Late for the Sky. And in that uh, album, there's a song uh, called For a Dancer by Jackson Brown. And it really sort of summarizes this first and second key to higher awareness. And uh, he just sort of postulates that most of us are dancers. And the lyrics to that song go like this. I'm not singing after Cecilia, I promise you that. She said, uh, he said, uh, just do the steps that you've been shown by everyone you've ever known until the dance becomes your very own. But in the end, there is one dance you'll do alone. And then later on in the song he says, go on ahead and throw some seeds of your own somewhere between the time you arrive and the time you go home. And those words really are very powerful for us because most of us are just that. Even though we don't like to admit it, we are dancers. We're not choreographers, we're dancers. We're doing the steps that we've been shown by everyone we've ever known until the dance has become our very own. But the noticer knows that in the end, there is one dance 
we'll do alone. But most of us are terrified of that. And so rather than leave and stop being a dancer, we just continue doing those steps. And we just sort of follow what we have been handed. And some of the things that we've been handed are that um, other people are responsible for our lives, that your talent is handed to you and it's dispersed in certain amounts and there's certain things that you can do and certain things that you cannot do. We've been taught that more is better and that we should chase after things when our, while our higher self is always saying just be peaceful. We've been taught that the petty tyrants who show up in our lives are people that um, we should ignore and we should hate. I want to tell you something. The most influential person in my life was the most tyrannical. The man who uh, abandoned me when I was uh, just a few months old, who put my mother in a hospital on several of occasions with his beatings, who spent five years in prison for stealing from the blind, selling their things and keeping the money. who walked away from a family of three boys during a depression and never paid a cent in child support and stole from everyone he came around who required me to go into an orphanage for the first ten years of my life and never showed up once to even say hello or I'm your father who then visited that same abuse on five additional women and died in New Orleans in 1964 of cirrhosis of the liver as a pauper and had his body shipped to Biloxi, Mississippi. It was my father. This petty tyrant who showed up in my life was someone that I had grown up and taught, been taught to hate. But when I found, that my, when I found myself at his grave in 1974, just a few months before I wrote Erroneous Zones, I had a transformational Epiphany, a natohi, a great awakening, a great seeing, when I was able to forgive my father. And in the process of forgiving my father, I was introduced to enlightenment and was able to get my life on purpose once and for all. At the time, I was overweight, I was drinking, I was not doing the things I wanted to do, I was in a bad relationship, I had no sense of any sense of morality that I have today. For me, uh, I thought that uh, monogamy was just a hard wood. <laughs> And after I left Biloxi in August 27th, 1974, I totally uh, had left behind. I used to dream about my father and I used to hate this man and I used to chase, try to find out where he was and why he had done what he had done. And when I went to his grave and stood there for three hours, and I've talked about this in some of my tapes and I wrote about it and you'll see it when you believe it. I don't have time tonight to tell the whole mystical story of how I got there. It was a, it was a miracle. The same kind of miracle that put Marcella and I together the other morning. The, um, the end result was that uh, my life absolutely turned around and we are here tonight sharing in whatever I have to share with you because of that experience. And this petty tyrant who so many of us think shouldn't have showed up in our life, the abuse that we had, the abandonment that we experienced, the, the relationships, the, the people who screwed us badly, the people who owe us money, who stole from us and all of that. We don't understand that it's all in order. In reading Betty Eady's book, Embraced by the Light, where she talked about uh, a man who had decided in nowhere to come here and just simply sit as a beggar, a homeless beggar on a street corner, just for the purpose of having this one man experience a sense of compassion in his life. And he said, yes, I'll sign up for that. I'll come here. Whether it's true or not is not even the point. Any more than when, when I was in New Orleans last weekend walking amongst the homeless 
and talking to a young girl named Seely from Olympia who was 16 years old and had been on the street for four years. And I put $100 into her hand after talking to her. She hadn't had a bath in four years, I don't think. And the people that I was with said, look, she's just going to go spend it on drugs. I said, it doesn't matter what she spends it on. It's one act of human kindness. That's all. One act of human kindness. If she wants to do, spend it on booze or drugs or dog food, it doesn't make any difference. It's the act of reaching out to another human being. That's what higher awareness is. And you have to, as the Bhagavad Gita teaches us, be detached from the outcome. Be detached from the fruits of your labor and stay in flow or on purpose. And so the petty tyrants that have been in your life are falls. Just like World War II and the Holocaust was a fall. And hopefully, not hopefully, assuredly, as a people, collectively, a war teaches us how to resolve disputes in a different way. And all of the stuff that you see going on out there, judging it is not important. In fact, when you judge another person or judge something else, you don't define it. You define yourself as someone who needs to judge. You can't define me by calling me a jerk or a fool. You only define yourself. All of that judgment about it. It's like when they ask Mother Teresa, will you march against the war in Vietnam back in 1967? She said, no, I won't. But if you have a march for peace, I'll be there. You get attached to what you are for and you keep yourself focused on that rather than all the hatred. That's why I ask you to turn off the OJ trial. To turn your attention away from the stuff that sends out the kind of energy. You know, they say that when Christ would go into a village, just his presence in the village would raise the consciousness of those around him. Just his presence in the village. Just the presence of Mother Teresa in a room, this four foot ten, reasoned little old lady who ministers to the poor in Calcutta and describes it as doing the work of Jesus in all of his distressing disguises. <laughs> Seeing Jesus in all of his distressing disguises is how she described it. That kind of consciousness permeates out. And we can have that when we shift our attention away from what is wrong and the hatred in the world. I mean, I get asked that question over and over again, yes, but what about this, and yes, but what about that? I say, I send out loving energy to every person I see on the street. I don't care what they look like. It doesn't make any difference whether they're clerks or whether they're waiters or whether they're people who walk by and smell bad or whatever. I look at them and I see the unfolding of God in every one of them. That is my challenge. To be able to do that and send it. And when you do, you impact not just that person and yourself, but the whole consciousness of the world. And quantum physics, which I don't have time to go into tonight, I talk about it in a couple of my books. As a matter of fact, I do want to say that I've talked to Louise Hay and to Deepak and Marianne and others about some of these kinds of things. And we're going to put out a newsletter on these kinds of issues and how they can be changed and what you can and where talks are like this are going to be uh, attended. And if you'd like to be on that mailing list, which will cost you nothing, just leave your name and address up on this stage before you leave in some way. And I'll put them all in a basket and uh, put it into their Hay House computer and you'll be on their list sending you that information. If you don't want it, toss it. So, the things that we've been taught by everyone we've ever known, you must have goals, petty tyrants are bad, more is better, my circumstances created my life, all of these kinds of things are things that we have to transcend. 
and leave behind us. And as we do that, we get to the second key to higher awareness, which I call banishing the doubt. And when you banish the doubt, what you really are doing is nothing more than coming to a distinction between the things that you believe and the things that you know. Shakespeare said, our doubts are our traitors. Now, Deepak and I have talked at length about creating a movie in the future in which we raise a group of a hundred children without any doubt. Without any doubt at all. That anything that they ask, can I do this, can I do this, the answer is of course. Everything is possible. I, one time, uh, in, in Asia, down in Bali, uh, met a tribesman who uh, was what they call a cloud maker. And it was his job to make clouds in times of drought on Bali. And I thought, what a great idea, idea, great idea, great idea, 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 cloud maker, maker, cloud maker. So I went home and I talked to my kids about that and I said, you know, uh, what we're going to do after dinner tonight, we're going to make clouds. What? Yeah, we're going to make clouds. We get some blankets and we lay them down on the grass and we go out there and we lay down and we say, now, this is my cloud over here, this one is yours, this one is yours, we're going to move them. I'm going to make a king, make a king, make a, make a kangaroo out of mine, I'm going to, and, and we're dire kids out there thinking they're making clouds. My kids have learned a long time ago. They're all scurvy elephants. They're independent, as Maslow said, of the good opinion of other people, <laughs> which is the highest place you can get and get to in self-actualization, to become independent of the good opinion of other people. And to be able and to understand that the same intelligence that moves clouds moves you and moves your thoughts and is you. So why would you believe in your separateness from them? If the same intelligence is flowing through them that flows through you, why not just reconnect to it? It's just a new way of processing your world without any doubt. William Blake, my favorite poet, as you probably know by now, <laughs> said, if the sun and moon should ever doubt, they would immediately go out. And so, Learning to abandon your doubt, to banish your doubt, is really, it really means putting the uh, consciousness that you have, this mind, this noticer, on notice, that you will not ever, you know, in a, in a world that we live in, no one knows enough to be a pessimist. No one knows enough to be pessimistic about anything. The, uh, the idea that there are things that we can't do or can't accomplish when this divine intelligence is limitless and without boundaries and is who we are is just one of those absurd notions that tells us that it is our lower identities that who we are, this body, rather than that which is noticing and watching it and living in it and is ageless and timeless and formless. So learning to distinguish between what you know and what you believe is nothing more then understanding that a belief is something that is handed to you by other people. It's one of the steps that you've been shown. All of these beliefs that you walked in here with tonight are things that other people have handed you. Now, when somebody else hands you something, it comes attached with doubt, like it or not, because it came from outside. Whereas a knowing comes from within and has no doubt attached to it. That which you know, you have no doubt about. And I'm suggesting to you that not only can you know how to ride a bicycle, even though you haven't done it for 20 years, and know how to ice skate and know how to swim and dance and make love and all of the things that you know how to do without any doubt, but you can also get to know God. Not believe in God, not know about God. You can come to know this higher part of yourself. Have in you, as St. Paul said, in the Philippians, the same mind as Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Do not be afraid to be God. Now that's a statement taken out of context, which a lot of people have a lot of difficulty with. But you must be willing to know God. And the only way you can know something is to have it come from within. And when it comes from within, there's never any doubt attached to it. And then the third key to higher awareness is what I call cultivating the witness. In the new book, by the way, um, in your sacred self, there's a chapter on every one of these. 
with all kinds of suggestions about these, and, and some of the tapes have talked about these as well. Cultivating the witness really means identifying yourself as the noticer rather than that which you are noticing. You detach yourself from here, you leave it, and you become the watcher. My spiritual teacher is a man named Nisargadatta Maharaj, who wrote a powerful book, who had a book written about him called I Am That, which was a collection of his dialogues he passed on in 1984. And he lived in Bombay. And Nisargadatta said that those, if you carry I Am That with you, the cities, the powers will be granted to you. And so I carry this with me. And I read from it, and there's 503 pages. And it's, uh, um, it's something that I read from almost every day. I've quoted it extensively in my new writing. And a woman came to Nisargadatta, who had given up all of his worldly possessions, who was a school teacher from England, who had cancer. And she was pleading with him to listen to her case. And she got very impatient with him and said to him, um, I have so many problems. And he said, you do not have any problems. And she said, how can you say that? He said, because your body has problems, but you don't have any problems. And she said, but I suffer. And as you heard me say earlier, he said, you do not suffer. Only the person you imagine yourself to be suffers. And then he gave what I consider the most powerful affirmation I've ever heard, which is I use every day. I have it written in my uh, car and on the mirror where I shave in the morning. He said, she said to him, you mean to tell me that you don't have any problems and you don't suffer? And uh, he said to her, ma'am, he said, in my world, nothing ever goes wrong. Now there's an affirmation. In my world, nothing ever goes wrong. I don't live in the world of the body and the ego. I live in the world of the spirit. And I am the witness to all of the rest of this. And I'm not attached to the outcome. I had a patient coming to me when I was a therapist years ago in New York, out on uh, the island, when I was teaching at the university. And uh, her name is Noreen. And Noreen uh, was a chronic depressive, and she came to me depressed and was told uh, that uh, this was a guy who wasn't going to sit around and be your friend, and you weren't going to purchase a friend. We're going to see about changing things, or we're not going to be in therapy together. And she said, uh, I asked her, I said, uh, how long have you been depressed? And she said, I've been depressed for years and years. I said, is there any ever time when you are not depressed? She said, I am always depressed. So I was looking for an entry point. I said, um, is there any organ in your body, perhaps, any part of your body that isn't depressed? She said, my, every organ in my body is depressed. I said, well, let's look at your dreams. When you sleep at night, are you? She said, I go to bed depressed. I take Prozac. I wake up depressed. I eat depressed. There is no part of me that is not depressed. She was really into her depression. And she was. I mean, she looked at it and acted it, and, and she wasn't kidding, and it was serious. I don't make light of it. And I said to her, Noreen, I said, uh, <clears throat> I said, I asked her the key question. I said, tell me, I said, uh, have you been noticing your depression more lately? And she said, yes, I have. That's why I've come to you, because the other therapy hasn't worked, and I really thought maybe you could offer me some hope. So I said, so you have been noticing it more lately? She said, yes. I said, well, then tell me, is the noticer depressed? And she was stumped. And that's where we began with the noticer, who cannot be depressed. The noticer just is the compassionate witness. That's where you have to go in your life. You want to rid yourself of pain? You want to rid yourself of, uh, of struggle, of suffering? You begin to observe it and not attach yourself to it. You watch your body do what it has to do. I'm doing it, I'm, I'm doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it right, right at Renta Wayne Dyer. I am watching it all. And you can see it 
As you become the compassionate witness and you understand quantum mechanics, you begin to see that where you place your attention, the observer, that which you observe, and keep on observing, that's what you begin to manifest. And the physical world becomes a reflection of how you witness. The observer himself or herself literally affects the outcome. And you can truly learn to manifest and control your coincidences, like us meeting like my former department head showing up, like all of you who've had these kinds of things happen to you in your life. You can begin through the process of witnessing to see it begin to manifest. If you abandon the doubt, if you erase the past, if you get rid of all the labels, you have got to let go of your, of your Italianness, your Jewishness, your maleness, your conservativeness, your Arizonanness, your blackness, your whiteness your oldness, your youngness, you are none of those things. You are a spiritual being, divine and eternal. And all the emphasis that you place on this physical world and the physical things that divide us will keep you back in the ego. There are no white people. There are no black people. There are no women. There are no men. As Gandhi said, in heaven there is no religion. There's nothing to divide any of us. When you see yourself as the witness, you eliminate all of those things. And once you've been able to cultivate the witness, you can begin to observe your body. You can observe your thoughts. You can see that you're not your thoughts. You are, you are that person who is thinking them. And you can literally place your attention on which ones you want and which ones you don't want. And then the fourth key to higher awareness is um, called shutting down the inner dialogue. Blaise Pascal, the very famous French philosopher and scientist, 17th century. He said, all of man's troubles stem from his inability to sit quietly in a room alone. You will not ever get to know God unless you can get to the field of all possibilities. As St. Mark put it, with God all things are possible. Now that leaves nothing out. And the way that you do that is you go through the layers of your mind from the surface where the chatter is to just below the surface where the analyzing is, the intellectual violence where you have to pick and tear everything apart, figure it all out. Lower to synthesis where you see how all things are brought and held together. Lower to where you quiet the mind. And ultimately coming to rest in the field of all possibilities, the limitless field. And here, in this place of rest, where you empty the mind of all thoughts, 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 between your thoughts, through the process of meditation or getting quiet or chanting or prayer or whatever you want to call that activity of sitting quietly alone, twice a day at least, for 30 minutes, you will come to know God. You will find in that field of all possibilities that nothing at all is impossible. Nothing. This is the place where Jesus performed his miracles. This is the place where a Sai Baba can manifest the gift of fish and loaves. And once the people say to him, how can you do that? How can you just manifest? I don't know. He said, how can you not? He is just there. Just like looking at a pond and seeing that the essence of a pond is not the surface where all the disturbances are, but below, where you get below the disturbances. In the mind, the surface is the chatter, the endless repetition of thoughts. And you know what that is? Just an endless repetition of the inventory of beliefs that have been handed to you by other people and all of your opinions about them. When you get past those, you get to that peaceful place that knowing. And after you get good at getting quiet and craving it, you will begin to see that not only is it meditation as a peaceful, beautiful, powerful experience, but what you bring back from the meditation is even more significant. And what you bring back is a solution of finding the key where you dropped it. What you bring back from that experience is a sense of peace and bliss and love 
and tolerance and kindness, all of the characteristics of your higher self, of your sacred self, instead of the characteristics of your ego. And that's the fifth and final key to higher awareness. I call it taming your ego. As you tame your ego, you no longer have the possibility of being offended. Absorbed. You have made the decision to be free. You are allowing, just like that blossom vanishes, you are allowing the lower, 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 lower self, the lower, the lower identity, entity, 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 will bring you to an understanding of what Robert Frost said in his poetry. He said, we all sit around in a ring and suppose, while the secret sits in the center and knows. And the secret that sits in the center and knows is really invisible, surrounded by form. In Zen they say, it's the space between the bars that holds the tiger. It's the silence between the notes that makes the music. It's not the note, it's the silence between. What allows a vase to be a vase is not the form, it's not the, it's, it's, it's not the uh, material, it's the space inside. If you hit and break it, the vase, all the material is still there, no vase. You have to have the space surrounded by form. That's who you are, space. Inner, divine, empty, quiet, formless, eternal space surrounded by a garage where you park your soul. In sailing to Byzantium, William Butler Yeats put it this way. He said, an aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Without that soul, without that divine, silent, empty, invisible, formless, eternal space within us, we're just tattered coats on a stick. Go within. Banish the doubt. Witness it. Get rid of all the labels. And know that you are here for one purpose and one purpose only. To find and serve God. And when you do, you'll understand what the Quakers would say at every single Sunday morning service. They said the service begins when the meeting is over. This meeting is over. God bless you. This has been a Hay House audio production. If you would like a free catalog of books and videos offered by Hay House, please call us at 1-800-654-5126 or visit www.hayhouse.com.